like all those really fancy preachers, uh, plan out a sermon schedule a, a year in advance. I don't. I never have. I don't think I ever will. But I do try to do about a month in advance. I, and mostly it's just scriptures and sometimes an outline. But mostly it's just scriptures and text. And so we had this scheduled for the going through the book of Romans. And then we've had everything that you can imagine interfere. And uh, so we probably should have been in the book of Revelation by now uh, if we haven't been going through the pandemic, shutdown, lockdowns, uh, isolation, quarantines, and whatever else they call it. So um, I, I was catching up on my study, catching up on my reading for the book of Romans in preparation for this. And, and I came through this passage and I was surprised. I, I realized that I've had a misconception about Romans chapter 5, I guess since I've been teaching Romans. And we taught it here as a Bible study not too long ago. Now, I wasn't wrong in the sense of being a heretic. <laughs> I wasn't wrong in the definition of the words. But I think, well, I know I was. I was wrong in the sense or the theme of this particular chapter and what Paul was saying to the Romans about salvation. Um, let me just give you a little bit of a, a, kind of a, a story that might give you an idea of the misconception I had, or a, of a misconception, a confusion. It's a story about a Marine who went down to um, a country western store, and he wanted some alligator boots. And they said, you know, with everything that's going on, we can't get any uh, alligator boots shipped to us, and uh, we just don't have them. It's, it may be, you know, years or months before we get any of those. And, he said, well, you know, I've got to go back to base pretty quick, and i got to get I'm on, on leave for a certain amount of time. I need some cowboy boots, so, yeah, those alligator cowboy boots. And so he said, after just arguing with the guy, the prior said, you know what? If you want cowboy boots, you're just going to have to go down to the bayou and, and get, get them off an alligator. And so he said, okay, well, give me directions. And so he got him some directions. He drove down to the nearest bayou. And uh, uh, not shortly after he left, a guy from the Army walked in, private first class. And he walks in and he says, I need some alligator boots. And he says, I just told that Marine we don't have any alligator boots. And he says, well, don't get upset. What happened to him? Where'd he go? He said, well, I told him to go down to the bayou if he's so anxious to get them. And he'd just have to get him himself. So not wanting to be outdone by Marine, he said, well, I'm going to go too. He got the directions. He drove down there. And so as he got close, parked his car, started walking up to the edge of the water there. He could hear in the distance splashing and thrashing. And he heard <laughs> this terrible wrestling going on, and then a big thump. And he, and he looks through the bushes, you know, and he sees this Marine. And he notices the Marine has pulled an alligator out by its tail. He's thumped it on the ground four or five times, and he looks it over, and then doesn't see what he wants, and so he jumps back in. And the, the Marine notice, I mean, the Army uh, private notices, there's three or four of these alligators laying on the shore. And so finally, he just walks up and he says, oh, yeah, what are you doing? And he said, well, that guy at the store told me to come down here if I wanted to get some alligator boots. And he said, I've killed four of them, and not one of them are wearing boots. <laughs> so he had a misconception. And you and I, I had a misconception about Romans chapter 5. So let me do a quick review for you. The first half of Romans chapter 1 gives us the theme for the book. Um, the book, which we, we call a book, but to Paul it was a letter that he wrote to the church at Rome. And the theme of righteousness of God is clearly stated in Romans 1, 16 and 17. Now, that is the theme for the entire book, the righteousness of God. And he goes through chapter by chapter showing us the righteousness of God. And you see it very clearly in chapter 1, 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed. From faith to faith, as is written, the just shall live by faith. So at that very early verse, he says, the gospel reveals, it is the power of God, and it reveals the righteousness of God through the gospel. Then in the very next verse, Romans chapter 1, verse 18, he says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. And so now he goes from the gospel revealing the righteousness of God to wrath and how God deals with wrath, also showing that God is righteous in the way that he deals with wrath. And that goes all the way through verse uh, 20 of chapter 3. Uh, and in that section, 
verses 118 through chapter 3, verse 20, which we covered, I think, last week. Um, the Bible tells us that all are guilty before the righteousness of God. And you can see this clearly in Romans chapter 3, go down to verse 22. He says, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so he says, here is the righteousness of God. In comparison to the righteousness of God, all men are guilty. Then the rest of chapter 3 tells us that God has overcome man's guilt through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Look down at the next verse, Romans chapter 3 and verse 24. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set, hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. And so once again, we see the righteousness of God is revealed in Jesus Christ and how God overcomes sin in us and guilt in us through the gift of Jesus Christ. Now, that brings us up to last week. So, as my misconception about this was that chapters 4 and chapters 5 are simply a, an amplification and a more of a thorough explanation of how to get saved. Romans chapter 3 tells us we're guilty. Uh, the end of chapter 3 tells us uh, the righteousness in Jesus Christ of, to those who believe. And chapter 4 gives us an example of Abraham as one who believed. Now look at verse uh, 3 of Romans chapter 4. In which Paul, the whole chapter of chapter 4 is used as Abraham is used as an example of this is salvation. If Abraham, as great as he was, was saved this way, then you and I have to be saved this way. Chapter 4, verse 3, for what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. He simply believed God. That's salvation. Believing what God says about how to be saved. Abraham did it. He said we're supposed to do it. So once we finish chapter 4, we now have the plan of salvation. To be saved, all a person must do is know they are guilty before God's righteousness and believe in Jesus Christ as God's propitiation, his covering over, his hiding of the sin under the shed blood of Jesus Christ when he died for us on the cross. That's what you have to believe. Now, you may not understand it fully, but that's what Abraham believed. That's what Job believed. All people have always been saved by the same thing. They believe what God says when he says, I will save you. They looked forward in the Old Testament. We looked backwards. Anybody ever tells you they were saved differently? They don't understand salvation. And, and that's exactly what Paul taught in Romans chapter 4. So here's my understanding about the book. I've always viewed chapter 5 as that further explanation of how a person is saved. As Paul describes it, this is what justification is. But Paul is not amplifying how to be saved. He's not expanding the idea of salvation and how to find it. He is now going on to revel or uh, to joy in the blessings of salvation, to revel in those things. He shares the joy and wonder of living as a child of God after salvation. And uh, so that we are calling this salvation living exclamation point <laughs> because that's what he's doing. He is just saying, isn't it great to be saved? Isn't it great to be a child of God? And then he says, let me share with you. Let me give you in all this chapter 5. And he does talk about salvation. And he gives us all these big words for salvation that we use all the time, like justification and remission and propitiation. And you need to understand those. But he's not saying this is how you get saved. He's saying now that you're saved, look at what God is going to bless you with. And so salvation living, Romans chapter 5 and verse 1. Let's read the first five verses. Oh, I forgot the exclamation point. Salvation living, exclamation point. I get excited when I find something new that I didn't know before. So Paul writes to the church at Rome and he says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus, through our Lord Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, patience, experience, and experience, hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. So here are the blessings of salvation. Now, I count seven. You could divide these in different ways or combine them in different ways. 
and come up between five and seven. But either way you look at it, these are the blessings that Paul gives us. I like seven because seven, again, is that number of completeness, the days of the week, uh, the, the years of the tribulation. So seven works for me. Seven works for God. It works for me. Let's do it that way. So here are the things. And the verbs that he uses in all these that we have is in the present tense and it expresses constant activity. In other words, he's not saying we were saved, which is what he did in chapter 4. He is saying we have these things now. They operate in us and they give us this great life. These are the constant daily life blessings of a child of God. So he says we have peace with God. That's the first blessing. He said we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. That's the second thing, access into faith. He said we can now glory in tribulation because we are saved even problems and difficulties. We glory in those things. We, we got through those things because we're children of God. And he says because of these tribulations, the very things that the world crumbles underneath, we go through them and glory in them, and they bring us patience, endurance. We grow stronger, not weaker in those things. And as we endure, we gain, he says, experience. That's the next gift. It's experience because we don't quit. You can't get experience if you give up, if you walk away. But if you keep going and you endure, then you gain experience. And then he says, because we are experienced and it's gained in us, we see how God delivers and protects, then we also have hope that maketh not ashamed. That means hope that is never disappointed. Never disappointed. Paul finally says we will never be disappointed in our hope because the Holy Spirit has been shed abroad, poured out generously, in our hearts. That's the old, my cup runneth over. And the cup running over is the Lord Jesus, is, is God pouring into our hearts the Holy Spirit. And he says, that's why we can never have a hope that's disappointed. We have the Holy Spirit. So we are to understand that we are in salvation living now. He's not looking at a past thing. He's not looking even at a future thing. He's saying, this is who you are. These are the gifts that God has given to you. These are the blessings that you have as a child of God. And this is the life that you should now live. I was so used to view, viewing Romans chapter 5 as a doctrinal discourse on justification that I missed the point of the chapters Paul wrote it. It's not so much how we are justified, but instead just look at what the blessings are that God has given to you because you are justified. In times like these, and in all tough times, and there are many, many, and there will be many, many more, we need to remember the blessings of salvation found in Romans chapter 5. That's what his point is. That's what I was missing. These days we are surrounded by turmoil, riots, protests, but it is of no account because God's word declares we have peace with God. It's their war, it's their riot, it's their difficulty, but we have peace with God. It should not affect us. When it seems that events will become too much for us, we just have to remember that we have access to grace. I can go to the throne of God and find strength with my Heavenly Father. When it seems like I can't get through what's going on around me, all I have to do is remember I have an open door that I can go to God in prayer. Then he says, through these many tribulations, and there will be many, uh, right now we're dealing with a worldwide plague, forced unemployment, bills going unpaid. But here's what you need to hear. Paul says, we glory in tribulations. Now, I know for most of us that we were looking at that saying, you know, I'm glad Paul was talking about imprisonments and beatings and trials and all those things that happened to those guys back there because that's not happening to me today. But what is happening to us today is a tribulation. It is a trial. It is a worry. And what he says here in Romans chapter 5 is you should glory in that. And if anybody is guilty of not remembering that, it's, it's me when I get on Facebook and I start talking about all the things that I believe and I don't believe and all the conspiracy theories and and it just, it just blows your mind, and you can forget. You know what we should be doing? Oh, God, thank you that we are Christians in this day and age because we can take a stand for you and glory in these tribulations. Let me tell you how I'm making it as a child of God. Next week on Facebook, when you see me writing about those other things, remind me that I just said that. <laughs> <laughs> and it will happen. He says, we glory in tribulations because we are blessed as the children of God. And tribulation only means we will endure. When all the others have collapsed and given up, we have patience. We will endure. And we will endure and gain the experience that can only come to those who grow stronger through hardships. 
That should be a description of every child of God. We will stand in hope, unashamed and unbeaten, because we are the children of God, and the Holy Spirit is poured into us. (laughs) How could we be anything else? but glorying in tribulations and enduring and finding strength and hardship because we have the hope of the Holy Spirit in us. Boy, that's a great first five verses of, of Romans. It's just a great idea. Did I tell you it's salvation living with an exclamation point? In case I forget that, that's what this is about. There was a uh, writing found in a prison uh, when a, in Africa when an African pastor, and we don't have his name, at least I've never found it in my research, uh, he was led out into a stadium, and uh, the Islamic government that had taken over his country put him to death. And after it was over with, uh, the family or his church went back, and they found this writing. And it's, it's one that, uh, it's just always been a blessing to me. And it's, it's somebody who knew the blessings of salvation that Paul was talking about here. He writes this, I'm part of the fellowship of the unashamed. I have Holy Spirit power. The die has been cast. I've stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I'm a disciple of his. I won't look back, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. My future is secure. I'm finished with low living, sight walking, small planning, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tame visions, mundane talking, cheap living, and dwarfed goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotions, plaudits, or popularity. I don't have to be first, tops, recognized, praised, regarded, or rewarded. I now live by faith, lean on His presence, walk by patience, lift up by prayer, and labor by power. My face is set, my gate is fast, my goal is heaven, my road is narrow, my way rough, my comparison, my companions few, my guide reliable, my mission clear. I cannot be bought, compromised, detoured, lured away, turned back, deluded, or delayed. I will not finish in the face, I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of the adversary, negotiate at the table of the enemy, ponder at the pool of popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. You can tell he was a preacher. I won't give up, shut up, or let up until I have stayed up, stored up, prayed up, and paid up, and preached up for the cause of Christ. I'm a disciple of Jesus. I must go till he comes, give till I drop, preach till, preach till all I know, and work till he stops me. And when he comes for his own, he will have no problem recognizing me. My banner will be clear. That's a child of God in the midst of tribulation. And that was the last thing he wrote. Now, we think it's the last thing he wrote. Nor is Paul finished now with the wonder of the Christian life. Go with me to Romans chapter 6 through 11. Salvation living, verses 1 through 5. Now, salvation joying. I think that could be turned into a verb. Oh, exclamation point. (laughs) That's not in my notes to keep repeating that, but I'm going to. Romans chapter 5 and verse 6. For, Paul says, when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Now, this passage is one of the reasons that I've always just looked at Romans chapter 5 as another further explanation of salvation. And it is that. It definitely tells us that God proved his love toward us and that while we were still sinners, he sent Jesus Christ to die for us. That is the plan of salvation. But Paul has already told them how to be saved. And what he's doing here is telling us because that's true and the wonder of it being true, we have joy in Jesus Christ. And it goes along with these blessings that he's talked about. So we have joy in Jesus. In that last verse, Paul says, we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And isn't that a truth that we need to grasp today and hold on to every day? If we go back in the paragraph, we can see why Paul says we have joy in Jesus. He says we joy in Jesus because he died for us. And we could never deserve, as sinners such as we were, we could never deserve such a gift. He says we joy in Jesus because we are justified by his sinless sacrifice and not by our ineffectual goodness. 
We joy in Jesus because we are justified by his blood, because we shall be saved from the wrath. We joy in Jesus because we are reconciled even though we were enemies with God. We joy in Jesus because if we were reconciled as enemies by Jesus' death, imagine what God has in store for us as his children by Jesus' life. And that's the point of that paragraph. The point is you were saved as sinners now just think of the blessings he's going to give you because you're his children. You were saved through his death, but imagine the power of his life operating in you. Isn't that, that's, again, I'm excited because I didn't see this before. I, I wrote it off as something less than what it is. This great blessing of having joy in Jesus is something I need in my life and we need in our life, especially at times like this. So where is our Jesus joy? <laughs> you know, I, I love the word joy when it comes to describing the happiness of the Christian life. Now, I don't really believe that there's a big j difference between joy in the Bible and happiness in the Bible. Now, I've heard sermons, and I've actually read Bible studies, but the real reality is, if you study the words, they really mean basically the same thing. But that doesn't mean I don't have a preference. I like the word joy. It's a great word. My mom liked it so much that she named my youngest sister, Shanna, joy. She liked it so much that she named both her daughters... Terica Joy, and then when she got real creative, she named her last child with a Bible name and the word Joy. So both of her daughters have the middle name Joy, and her last daughter, she took from the Bible, <laughs> one of the famous women of the Bible, and also the land of the Bible, and she named her Tirza. So now say it in your mind, Tirza Joy. <laughs> Uh, so now she has to go through life as a biblical pun. <laughs> but I think she really enjoys it. It's a very unique name. <laughs> I have also have a dear aunt who's named Joy. So maybe I love the word because of family connections. But all of us should love the word Joy because of our Jesus connection. And that's Paul's point. In the last lesson of life that Jesus taught the disciples before he went to the cross, Joy was one of his themes. So up here on the screen, or you can turn to John chapter 16, your Bible. There are, all these verses are there in John chapter 16. In the midst of losing him, in the midst of being under the threat of arrest and the conspiracy that was about to completely surround and engulf them and that Jesus would die that night, and he told them exactly that. But in the midst of all that, joy is one of his themes. And he says in John chapter 16, verse 20, Verily, verily, I say unto you, most... Truly, assuredly, this is the truth. Depend on it. I say unto you that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice, and ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow, because her hour has come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy than a man is born into the world. And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again. And your heart shall rejoice, and your joy shall no man taketh from you. Verse 24. Hitherto shall, have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. And then in chapter 17 and verse 13, one of my favorite verses. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in them. He was talking about us. We were the world that he was talking about. And he said, listen to this, believe in me, follow me, and you will have my joy in you. Joy is something that should define the Christian life. It is certainly one of the blessings of God that we have in our life, but it is something that should be seen in us in the midst of these trials and difficulties. There's an old story about some miners. It probably isn't true, but it's still a good story. It takes place in uh, uh, the 1840s when they went out to California and they were searching for uh, gold out there at Sutter's Mill and in that area. And so one particular group went out there. They found nothing. They found nothing. They were ready to, to give up. And as they were gathering and filling their canteens, one of the uh, prospectors looked down in this team of about four men and saw some shining stones at the bottom, and he picked them up, and sure enough, it was gold. And so they picked up what they could, but they were out of supplies. And so they started headed back into town, and uh, we're going to buy some new supplies. And they told each other, whatever you do, don't say anything. We've got to get back there. We've got to get the claims, and then we've got to get back here and work the claim. And if you say anything to anybody, there'll be so many people here that we won't be able to work the claim. 
we'll have problems. So they went back into town, they bought their supplies, loaded up their donkeys, and as they're walking out of town, they looked behind them and there was a, tra a trail of 10, 15, 20 other prospectors following them. And they looked at each other and said, did you say something? And he said, no, I didn't say anything. Did you say something? No, I didn't say anything. So finally they looked behind him and said, why are you following us? They said, well, we know you've struck gold. We know you're headed to a rich claim. And they said, but how do you know that? We didn't say anything. And they said, you didn't have to say anything. It shows in your face. Your faces are glowing. And as Christians, that's what should show in our lives. <laughs> you shouldn't have to even say anything. You should just be the child of God who is aglow with the joy of Jesus Christ. So now, what else could Paul possibly add to the blessings that we have in salvation and the joy that we have in Jesus? That's the last point. The next verse takes it one step higher, if you can imagine that. Not just salvation blessings and salvation living and the joy that we have with Jesus Christ, but salvation reigning with Jesus. So go with me to verse 12 of Romans chapter 5. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. For until the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure or the symbol of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also is the free grace, free, free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift of grace, which is by one man Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift, for the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. The last blessing of salvation that Paul talks about is reigning with the Redeemer. Now, as you read this last paragraph, verses 12 through 17, what you're looking for is a contrast. Uh, Paul builds this contrast. It's a contrast between what was and what is, who we were and who we are now. In verse 12, he says, wherefore. Uh, we would put it in our today's vernacular as therefore. So we know that Paul is drawing a conclusion. He's giving a summary of everything he said. And it could be all the way back to chapter 1, verse 18, all the way to this point, because he definitely takes a big change of subject in chapter 7. Oh, and it could just be chapter 5 that he's dealing with up to this point. But he says wherefore, so he's going to give us this conclusion. And he says, wherefore, as by one man, in verse 12, sin entered into the world and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So he sums up what he proved in the first chapters. All have sinned, and death is proof of that sin. No way you can argue with that. Death always has the final word, and Paul says that final word is you've all sinned, and death proves that you're sinners. There's no escaping this. There's no exceptions to this. We die because we sinned. Then in verse 15, he gives us this contrast between what Adam did and his gift of death to what Jesus did and his gift of life. Look at Romans 5, verse 15. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift of grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. Now, the King James wording here is a little awkward in our ears, where it says... But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. What, it's, what he is saying is, but the free gift is not like the offense. Here's the contrast. Here's the difference. It's not the same thing anymore. It's completely different. There's no comparison. There can only be a vast contrast because Adam's legacy to us as our federal head. I just want to throw out a little bit of my theological training there. Adam is our federal head. Our sin comes from Adam because he was the first of us. Um, because Adam's legacy to us is sin and death, but Jesus' gift to us is life. He says, if many are dead through Adam's sin, much more the grace of God and the gift of God through Jesus Christ has abounded, abundantly been given to many. Then in verse 17, he gives us the final, final blessing of salvation. Romans 5 and verse 17. For if by one man's offense death reigned by many, and this is the contrast, 
Much more, they which receive abundantly of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. So what he's saying is now in place of Adam's sin, making death our ruler, through the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, we are made rulers in this life over death through Jesus Christ. That is an amazing thing. That we are not here to be victimized. We are not here to just survive. We are not here just to try and squeak through until heaven's gates open. But we are here as rulers in this life. We reign with Christ now. We should understand this because it's definitely going to be true in the future. And we need to ask ourselves, we're left with this one question, this one exhortation, this one wonderful reality to grasp. Are we ready to reign with Jesus Christ? It's easy for us to lose sight of who we are as Christians in this world. That's why you can never read too much Bible or repeat too many times the truth of Romans. We are viewed by this world as inconsequential. At best, we're a nuisance. At worst, we are an evil in our present society. There is no mistake when they call you a hater. They honestly believe that you are the problem in this country today, in this society today, and in this world today. And so it's too, often too easy to fall into that state of mind that accepts the world's view, not as truth, but as the way things simply are now. Into that state of mind, we need the Holy Spirit to bring the words of Romans chapter 5, and verse 17. <laughs> We reign in this life. We reign with Jesus Christ in this life now. We are rulers of our life through the abundance of grace and the gift of God's righteousness. We are rulers right now. Paul told the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 2 that they need to keep this in mind in the actions within their own church. He said, do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that ye sh we shall judge angels? <laughs> How much more things that pertain unto this life? Paul is saying, understand who you are. You're a ruler in this life. So rule the things in the church the way you should. Rule the things in your life the way you should. Jesus speaking to his apostles in Luke chapter 22 and verse 29. He said, and I appoint unto you a kingdom as my father hath appointed unto me, that you may eat and drink at the table at my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Now that is a special uh, rulership that's reserved for the apostles, but nevertheless it is still akin to the ruling and the reigning that we have in Jesus Christ. No matter what opposes us or seems to defeat us, the truth is that in this life right now we are reigning with Jesus Christ. What a difference it'll make when we know we are rulers over sin, our sin, rulers over our worries, rulers over our problems through the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. I noticed as I was writing this, I kept repeating that phrase because it's such a wonderful phrase. The abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. I'm going to close with an illustration. It's a, one I, I use often. Uh, in World War II, the Japanese invaded the Philippines, and the United States, who had a base over there, were not prepared for it, not at all. They were outgunned, they were outmanned, they were outthought, they were outfought. And um, Douglas MacArthur needed to make a retreat. And so, in order for him to save what he could, he left a general, General Jonathan Wainwright, in charge of an island um, or a city there in the Philippines, uh, corridor, and he told him, hold this at all cost. You have to hold it, because if you don't, we won't be able to get out. And so General Wainwright fought. For weeks he fought. MacArthur had promised him reinforcements. There were no reinforcements. MacArthur had promised him supplies. There were no supplies. The Japanese completely surrounded them. They couldn't get anything in. They couldn't get anything out. Finally, the Japanese sent in an ultimatum and said, if you don't surrender... And they were out of ammunition. They had more men that were wounded than they could have fighting. But the Japanese said, if you don't surrender, when we do take you, and we will take you, we'll kill all of your men, and we'll kill every person in the city that you're trying to defend. And so Wainwright, knowing that he couldn't fight anymore, surrendered. He was captured by the Japanese. He was held as a prisoner in, the, in a Manchurian Chinese concentration camp. And while he was there, he felt and believed in his heart that he had failed his country. He had failed his superior officer, MacArthur. Worst of all, he felt like he had failed his men. In prison, 
and in fact, in the whole war, he was the highest ranking officer that was ever captured by the enemy. Nobody else ever captured a general, but Wainwright was that man. He became a broken, crushed, hopeless, starving man, both physically and spiritually. He was ruined. On August the 14th, 1945, the Japanese surrendered. And about a week later, a colonel in the United States Army was sent into that camp and went to General Wainwright and said, the Japanese have surrendered. You are now in command. <laughs> Wainwright heard the news. This broken man, a walking skeleton at this point, scars on his back, bruises all over his body from the beatings he'd received from the, from the guards. And as he walks back to his hut, two of the men who had just the day before beaten him, humiliated him, and, and treated him like dirt, gave him an order, told him to do something. <laughs> Wainwright stood up, looked his tormentors in the eyes and said, No, I am in command. Now these are my orders. That picture of General Wainwright understanding the authority he had to rule and reign as the commander of that camp is the way it should be for us after we read God's word and know the full blessings of salvation. There is nothing in this world that should be able to overcome you as a child of God. You rule and reign with Jesus Christ. And whatever it is that you're facing, whatever it is that's tormenting, whatever you that's beating you, look it in the eye and say, no, through Jesus Christ, my Lord, I am in command here. There is no worries. There's no fears. There's no sin. There is nothing that you cannot overcome through Jesus Christ. That's what Romans chapter 5 teaches us. What a tremendous, tremendous lesson. So as we conclude this morning, child of God, we leave here this morning. And I want you to remember the blessings of your salvation. Paul says we have peace with God. We have access to grace. We glory even in tribulations. We have unfailing endurance. We are gaining experience, and through that experience, we know the power of a hope that can never be disappointed. And overall through this, we have the Holy Spirit, God's own presence, poured out into our hearts. The idea of just the overflowing power of the Holy Spirit in us is amazing. We have joy in Jesus, and we rule in this life through Jesus now that really is salvation living, exclamation point. <laughs> that's my prayer as you go from here. That's what you take with you. You are a child of God. Now live as a child of God in all those wonderful blessings. Have joy in Jesus and reign with him over whatever comes your way. Let's all stand. We're going to take our hymnals.